next we turn to part of radio's history, and specifically the mobile recording unit, which was introduced to Radio Erin just 70 years ago, and which changed radio. Well, the original unit, in fact, was Seamus Ennis's old 14.9 Ford. We'll hear from Pontius O'Conlon presently, but first the state of radio in the late 1940s. Lone O'Brien, then Secretary of the Department of Posts and Telegraphs. We got, for the first time, a, a proper news service, a couple of orchestras, outside broadcast officers and the professional rep. And among the outside broadcast officers was the young Sean McRaymond. Um, in fact, what our job was, and I recall the terms of the job spec, to seek throughout the country, including the Gaeltacht, material suitable for recording and suitable broadcasting. Uh, now, this was a, a, a big step forward in uh, Irish broadcasting. Indeed, it hadn't been all that long um, a feature of broadcasting uh, anywhere, particularly in those countries uh, where broadcasting had been arrested by the, by the war. We weren't, of course, but on the other hand, we had our emergency and we were cut off in various things. There was a great expansion of radio here in 1947. The method of recording was not so much portable as transportable. A heavy van with a disc-cutting machine on board. Each disc lasted only four minutes, when the interview had to be interrupted. We were recording in four-minute units. An interview either had to be kept within four minutes or you stopped. You, you came to a soft landing halfway through the interview and then you, you waited while another disc was put on. Uh, it was very awkward in that sort of way. Of course, it was such a wonder at first. The wonder was not that it was done badly, but that it was done at all. And there was another reason for wonder. All of these innovations were happening under the watchful eye of the Department of Finance and happening despite the Department's parsimony. The then Director of Programmes, Robordo Farrakhan, complained about what he called their adherence to the Manchester School of Economics. They just... Uh, oh, some, at one stage, four turntables were asked for, for one of the studios, four turntables for gramophone records. And the officer dealing with the matter in finance asked, would one not do? Lowen O'Brien, himself seconded from that department, was more forgiving. Well, of course, that, 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 that is their role. They have to be tight, they're tight with everybody. But they did approve of the purchase of the mobile recording unit, the MRU, as it was called. And it came into service just 70 years ago. Now, with me in studio, I have Sean McRaymond. This is Kieran Sheedy. Sean, before we go to you, could we just play for you? I'm sure you haven't heard this now, I think, for almost 40 years. It's a 1948 recording you did in County Leitrim with Mrs Hello. Vera McCarthy, the uh, Leitrim County Librarian. It might bring back some memories to you. Indeed, indeed. I remember it well. Would you say, Mrs McCarthy, that reading does play a prominent part in the life of the people of the country? Oh, yes, very definitely so, because in Leitrim there is very much el little else to do in the leisure moments of the people. We only have, I think, picture houses in three of our towns so far, and uh, with the result that uh, the people in the smaller towns and in the more rural areas who have not the picture house to go to spend their leisure moments reading. And I'd say that Leitrim County is one of the best counties, if not the best, counties for reading in Ireland. Well, it certainly must be judging by that list. Morning, ma'am. Oh, I see we have a visitor here. Yes, that's right. There's a customer now, I'm afraid I'll have to go and attend to her now. I'm on, on knitting, on play knitting now. Yes, knitting. well, now I'll, I'll see what I can do for you. <laughs> well, I think I'd better not interfere with the good work any longer. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mrs. McCarthy. Oh, you're very welcome indeed. I'd be glad to see you any time you call. Rural electrification was, had, had, was hard, had hardly really got underway in Ireland. In fact, the big campaign came in 1848, 49, and we played a not you know, a modest part in that too. Selling, you know, going around propaganda work. We were helping with the, the there was a great work of propaganda being done by organizations like Mention Atira, you see. And um, we were able to do programs about it and so on. All of us in, in Radio World, I mean, it involved news staff and everybody. But um, my point here is that um, when we went out first in 47, I mean, your average village, your average tinier town, smaller town in Ireland was dark at night. And I remember, I remember Mrs. McNally's very well because, of course, the drummer was quite. We were in pitch dark in the, in the little village, and and uh, there was an oil lamp or something. It was, it's, it's, a, it's a world, I mean, which people only now dimly remember. But we were in on it, as it were. That sounds uh, 
predatory. But what I mean is that we we did uh, succeed, perhaps, in recording some some of the things that happened in Ireland before the great change. Now the great the changes, the full changes in Irish life, perhaps in the the Cultural Revolution didn't begin until the early 60s. Uh, but nevertheless, there are a lot of things happened in the 50s which changed. The, and, and the first of these, I think, at the end of the 40s was real electrification. And this is Seamus Ennis at work with the mobile recording unit. The You'll pardon me for butting in like this. I'm a stranger here, and I heard there was a dance on. I haven't been invited or anything else. Hello, I my thought aunt. I'd look in and see what was going on. Hello, my honest neighbour. You're welcome into any old farmstead in Tipperary at any other night. Thank you my, very much. I happen to be the proprietor of this house. Uh, my name is Patsy Fagan from Ballinamona. Any harm that's your name, sir? My name is Seamus Ennis. How do Pleased you do? to meet you, Seamus Ennis. You're quite welcome into the old-fashioned dance. Well, thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, what's the name of God is that whole thing you have there in your hand? The name of God is... If I... it's, it's a microphone. A microphone? Yes. Oh, dear. Well, we'll forget about that. Yes, I just Seamus. said I'd look in and see what's going on, and I want you to tell me something about your old-fashioned dance. Well, the original unit, in fact was Seamus Ennis's old 14.9 Ford. Prontius O'Conlon. Because uh, <laughs> we all arrived there in 1947 and there was no actual transport. <laughs> it, it just wasn't available or hadn't been rigged up or whatever. And uh, it was to be one of the old post office vans, the V8 Ford, which was a huge, ungainly affair. Yes. And I remember when it was actually rigged up, you had all the recording disc cutting equipment. Now this was in 1948 when it was eventually assembled and it was all on one side of it and the operator sat opposite this and the door opened so that if you're going around a corner somewhere in Donegal at any sort of speed you were likely to end in the ditch which indeed we often did you know, going around corkscrew bends got stuck there and couldn't get any further and th that's uh, right because the equipment in the van you had disc cutting equipment. disc cutting equipment there was no yes. such thing as tape no tape until 1951, I think. So, or, or what would you do? You so we, all right. You were sent off into the far reaches of Donegal, say, and you were going there to record some music. Would it be music? Well, it could, oh. uh, features. We called it mostly in those yeah. days. Uh, we worked on features, uh, and it was mostly features we'd be doing, which would be called documentaries mm. nowadays. Yeah, and naturally, in the course of recording material of interest in any particular area, you take the local songs or whatever music That's right. was going. So what would you do? The van wouldn't be able to get to certain places, it was That's so right. big. So what would you do? Uh, you'd park away down sometimes at the bottom of a lane and you'd have a cable a hundred yards long, possibly you brought your microphone into the kitchen of the house and uh, you'd no visual control very often over the recording and you'd have uh, Johnny Spillane or Jimmy Mahon or Ned Nugent or some of the people who were on the recording end of it in those days, they would be out sitting in the van. You were there, possibly up a laneway, and with uh, with the person who was going with to the person perform, who was yeah. going to be interviewed or, or sing or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you thought everything was ready, you'd say, "Right, Ned, we'll go ahead ten seconds from now." And you'll often hear that indeed on some of the old archive material. People wonder why it is, but yeah. it's because you had no visual control yeah. and you had to let him know that you were ready yeah. to roll it. Yeah. And uh, very often indeed the first cut wouldn't go well or uh, the, the person in the van wasn't ready to yeah. go or something and else. And there were 78s, right. the original ones, so yeah. that you could only take yeah. about uh, three minutes or and then you suddenly ran out and it was very difficult to explain to some old man of 80 that you wanted them to go over all that again or start in the That's middle of right. a story. <laughs> this morning's programme was based on original programmes by Mike Murphy, Sean McRaymond, Kieran Sheedy, Lone O'Brien, Rabor the Farrakhan, Kevin Healy, Charlie Bird, David Handley, David Davenpower, Peter Brown, Connor Sweeney, Pruntius O'Conlune, Connor Cruz O'Brien, and myself. The mobile recording unit was mobile, but it was not nimble. Ready, Joe? Yeah. Start recording five seconds from now. Five seconds later. All set, Jimmy? Sure. Right. Start recording five seconds from 
The famous storyteller Peg Sayers was among the first to be recorded. But the important thing was that um, previously putting talent, as it were, putting the country, putting rural Ireland, putting provincial Ireland, I know all these phrases are loaded, putting all this on the air was a big deal. I mean, either you went down and had a full-blown uh, broadcast, especially broadcast our people had to come to Dublin and they went through processes of rehearsal and studio and all that. This was literally bringing the mic to the people. The heat was sweltering and the dancing energetic. These, the men and women who should have been limp after a gruelling day's work. It widened the horizons of the people with whom the mobile recording unit, as it's called, came in contact. <laughs> French Boy Scouts singing for Sean McRaymond in Kerry. But uh, the idea originally was that the mobile unit would go out and collect material. Another of the pioneers, Pruncius O'Conlon. In the end, uh, Sean McRaymond, Ennis, myself, Norris Davidson, P.P. Maguire, we were all presenter, producers. You did everything. You actually put the discs on as well. You know, you put your own discs on. <laughs> you had f- yeah. two turntables on each side, and this was going out live. Very so. easy to make a mistake, and once the mistake was made, it went out. There was very little you could do That's about right. it. And sometimes risking life and limb. Norris Davidson did it all himself, reporting here on a tree felling. It was while we were recording for the programme called The Electrification of an Irish Village. Near Kerr, trees were being felled so that the wires might cross fields, and I decided to make a recording of this. An undercut was made to direct the fall of the tree, and then sawing and hammering went ahead, like this. <laughs> it was a windy day, and fortunately, I happened to notice that the tree that was going to fall in a direction other than that intended, in fact, it was going to fall on top of me. When the first groans began, I deserted my post. Microphone in hand, I ran for my life as that tree toppled. And on the end of this recording, you'll hear my comment to the engineer at the other end of the line as this giant came crashing down. And that was nearly on top of me, and so it was. P.P. P. Maguire also had his adventures, bringing the mobile recording unit to Dublin Zoo to hear the snakes. The two cobras raised their heads and stared at us with vicious little eyes. Nervously, I held the microphone, which had been mounted on the end of a stick, just inside the cage. There was a pause. We looked at the snakes, and the snakes looked at us, and nothing happened. I was on the point of saying, hopefully, well... <laughs> There doesn't seem to be anything doing. When Mr. Flood took the microphone from me, leaned forward and, to my unutterable horror, jabbed the two snakes with it. Immediately they flashed into a fighting position, hissing and striking the microphone again and again. And then one of them started for the open door. Mr. Flood spotted them, whipped the microphone out, slammed the door and said casually, they're very dangerous, you know. Nor were these the only dangers working with the mobile recording unit. We were coming from Grisale towards Dulach. Road conditions were not always good and the mobile recording unit had the heavy equipment on one side of the van, as Pruncius O'Conlon remembers. And the Mayo roads had a particularly bad reputation, I remember, in those days. But uh, we were going along this narrow road full of potholes with uh, oh what you'd call in the north a shuch you know a big gully on on either side of it and uh, Johnny Spillane who was driving the mobile unit at the time was trying to avoid the potholes but he went too close to the edge the van just went right over and into the ditch I got my I was in the passenger seat I got my feet against the door and uh, it didn't actually turn over because there was a, a ditch or something to stop it there. Now of course one aspect of this whole thing was the living folk tradition of Ireland um, about which more perhaps there were more pious platitudes than there were uh, actual um, good deeds done 
in those days, uh, with, of course, the great and uh, very honourable exception of the Irish Folklore Commission, which had, uh, on very tiny resources, done an immense job of recording and cataloguing, of, in their own phrase, gathering the fragments. Um, and Seamus Ennis had been part of that enterprise before he came to us. Uh, he had worked, in other words, in the field. He had... Uh, collected folk songs, he'd collected traditional music, I suppose all over Ireland, in the Gaeltacht, outside the Gaeltacht. And talking about Gaeltacht, he also did it in Scotland, in the, in the, in the Scottish Gaeltacht, where um, uh, there was a, um, a joint project, I think, with the, with the Folklore Institute of Scotland, which is part of the Board of Scottish Studies, I may have that wrong, but that was... And he made great contacts there. Now, one of the things that was I remember from that time was that um, I was astonished, of course, that whenever, wherever I went with Seamus, in the Gaeltacht, uh, he seemed to take on the accent, and the ac- in every sense of that word, and the uh, approach in speech, the intonation, the idiom, the way of looking at things of the particular area he was in, with the result that um, one thought of him as a... As a <laughs> a native speaker from County Kerry or County Cork, if he were in County Kerry or County Cork, similarly in Galway, in Mayo, in Donegal. But uh, what I was very interested and amused to hear later was that the same thing was true in, in Scotland. And that, I think, was the, perhaps the kernel of his, of his um, genius, that in the whole range of the folk world, he had a capacity for... I would say the almost instant transmutation of what came to him and making it his own without distorting it. Now, it wasn't clever mimicry. I have heard people who can mimic a traditional singer say. And, I mean, we, we, we've all suffered the bad ones, the things who think that they, they put the nya in it and all that. But we've heard clever ones too. But Seamus wasn't, wasn't just that. It wasn't just catching the intonation. It, by some magic... He was the singer from that area. All day the work went on. A great cloud of dust, almost as thick as a mist, floated on the light breeze over the haggard. This is Seamus Ennis' Harvest Day, 70 years ago. It filmed my face and hands and clothes and made my throat rasp with dryness. The work was thirsty work, and occasionally the men broke off at a signal from the tractor horn and drank quickly. Then back to work. As the stacks of corn were reduced to their bases, the field mice that had grown fat in their abundant storehouses began to panic and scuttle for escape. I, not being wise about sugons around the trousers, became a joke for the whole haggard when a mouse sought refuge, well, where mice should not. Did they laugh, those men? And were those interviewed or those invited to play music or sing, were they in awe of the microphone? Mike Murphy asked Pranchia Sokunlu. This would have been their, literally their introduction to the higher reaches of technology. Uh, so what was their general reaction? A lot of them, of course, would have been used to uh, folklore collectors like Sean O'Hahi, for example, in Donegal, who had Ediphone recordings uh, and had uh, done recordings with them on the Ediphone. But quite a few others would, as you say, would have. This would have been their first experience of yeah. it, and of course, a lot of them too in the in the Gaeltacht areas, uh, anywhere in the country in those days, they were very suspicious of characters from Dublin who yes. thought we might be pensions officers or <laughs> someone inquiring into their affairs. Yeah, and and quite a lot of them could have been quite suspicious of us. <laughs> And were they self-conscious in front of a microphone then? Did they know what was going on kind of thing? Well, no, I, I found the very opposite. Most of them were completely uninhibited and that, that uh, I think, is one of the great characteristics, uh, particularly of the Gaeltacht and country people, that they aren't particularly inhibited. They'll talk away as long as they have something to say and they, they forget the technical end of it altogether and yes. uh, behave completely naturally. Yes. And that's what Sean McRaymond did too. He was generally well informed, but more importantly, he was curious and credited here with being a gifted interviewer. One branch of this work presents so many difficulties that its mastery might be regarded as an art in itself. 
the art of the interview. His own emphasis was that he had few qualifications when originally recruited for the job. My own qualifications had nothing to do with this kind of field work. I had done a degree in Celtic studies and modern languages in Galway. I had worked for three years in the Department of External Affairs, now Foreign Affairs. And when I came to broadcasting, oh, the only qualification I had for broadcasting was an immense enthusiasm for it, with a very small experience of taking part in student shows on the radio and so on. And um, and also, perhaps, uh, because of the terms of this particular ad, uh, a desire to get to know the country, <laughs> preferably at somebody else's expense. So, um, uh, Seamus, however, Seamus was the exception. Seamus did have a qualification he, that he had worked in this field, in the Irish Folklore Commission. And uh, th- there were no ways then, if there are today, of uh, get- getting... Um, that specialised kind of training for that sort of work. I mean, oh yes, you can have training now for field work in broadcasting, both radio and television, but I mean, the peculiar kind of oh, techniques you needed to extract the, the authentic tradition. And uh, may I say that Seamus had the most uncanny, as well as this capacity for, um, as I say, appropriating and, uh, as it were, renewing and giving out again, this, uh, this recreating, in fact, what he heard. He also had an extraordinarily sharp ear, an unbelievably sharp ear. Of course, that was part of it. But also, not just the ear for accurate reproduction, but the ear for detecting the authentic from the phony. And that is a very necessary part of any, of any, of, 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 of the equipment of any man who's doing field work in, the, in, this, in this area. Or it could be said in any aspect of broadcasting. That feature to mark the 70th anniversary of the mobile recording unit and featuring some of the pioneers, Sean McRaymond, Prontius O'Conluin, Seamus Ennis, Norris Davidson and P. 